Well, that short clip says it all. The purpose of the rotary dial in the step-by-step -step telephone switching system is to cause and control the stepping of the Strouger switches. The rotary telephone dial was invented in 1896 by three brilliant engineers who worked for Elman Strouger in his Strouger Automatic Telephone Exchange Company. Their names were Alexander Keith and two brothers, John and Charles Erickson. This is what the dials looked like during the first decade after their invention. Notice that the numbers and the finger wheel holes are arranged in an arc-shaped pattern. By 1907, the dial had been redesigned to a completely round shape as seen here. This shape endured for the remainder of the rotary dial's manufacturing life cycle. The dial that you're looking at is a Bell System No. 2 dial made in the 1930s. It still works and has a wonderful clickety-clack sound that is lacking in more modern rotary dials. Looking at the dial from the front, the part that rotates is called the finger wheel, which contains 10 finger wheel holes. Behind the finger wheel is a number plate that contains a combination of numerals and letters. When the dial is at rest, as is seen here, it is said to be in its normal position. When the dial is rotated away from its normal position, as can be seen here, it is said to be off normal. When the dial is normal, each finger wheel hole lines up with a specific numeral or a numeral letter combination. So the 10 finger wheel holes capture all the decimal system numerals of 1 through 9 and the 0. The 0 is handled a special way in the step-by-step -step system in that it is always treated as if it were the number 10. In finger wheel hole positions 2 through 9, there are three letters of the alphabet. These are arranged in ascending alphabetical order. These are there because up until the 1960s, telephone numbers contained exchange names as well as numerals. In the most common setup, callers would dial the first two letters of the exchange name followed by five numerals. As an example, here is a telephone set with its number card in the middle of the dial. As shown, the telephone number is Beechwood 45789. And this is also how it would appear in the telephone directory. The exchange name is Beechwood. Notice that the first two letters of the exchange name are in uppercase and in a much larger font than the rest of the name. This highlights to the customer the two letters that are to be dialed, followed by the five numerals. Notice that the letters Q and Z, or Z as it's pronounced in the USA, do not appear on the dial. That's because the letters Q and Z were never used as the first two letters of exchange names. Notice that on our number two dial, there is a Z in the zero position. The Z was added in the mid-1930s on some Bell system dials with the introduction of a new toll-free calling arrangement called Zenith. Businesses advertised their Zenith numbers, such as Zenith 51234, but the customers could not dial these numbers. They had to get the operator in order to complete the connection. So the Z was added to the zero position to accentuate to the customer that if you wanted a Zenith number, you must dial zero. The step-by-step -step equipment does not recognize or process letters. It is the numeral in the finger wheel hole where the letters are that is significant. The dial converts numerals into pulses. Think of a numeral as being composed of the sum of a series of ones that make up its value. For example, numeral 5 consists of the sum of five ones, or numeral 9 consists of the sum of nine ones. Each pulse is like a one, so if numeral 5 is dialed, five pulses are generated. As noted earlier, 
Numeral zero is treated as if it were the number 10. So if zero is dialed, 10 pulses are generated. At this point in time, it's probably a good idea to learn how to properly use the dial. Here's a description from a 1959 telephone directory. When you dial, keep the receiver off the hook, place your finger over the desired numeral or letter, turn the dial all the way around to the finger stop, release the dial and allow it to return without interference. To see how a dial works, first looking at it from the front, we'll dial a zero. Now let's look at that again in slow motion. Now let's turn the dial around and look at it from the back. At the top you'll see a series of screw terminals for attaching wires and then there's a set of five electrical contact springs and at the bottom is a small brass cylinder with some movable parts inside. The brass cylinder uh, contains the governor mechanism when a dial is rotated and the finger is released, the rate of return of the dial is controlled by this governor. And the rate of return that it is designed to is such that it will generate nominally 10 pulses per second. Let's take a look first at these top three contacts. We'll call them one, two, and three. Contacts one and three, the thick ones, are stationary, while contact two, the middle thin one, is movable. When the dial is at rest, as it is now, contacts one and two are connected together at their contact points. When the dial is off normal, contact two moves away and opens up from contact one and connects two contact number three. Let's watch the contact operation as the dial goes off normal. The off normal contacts remain in this position until the dial returns to normal. With the off-normal contacts operated, the path through the receiver in the telephone set is opened to reduce clicking noises during dialing. In addition, the transmitter circuit is bypassed so that the resistance of the loop is reduced. Now let's take a look at the bottom two contacts. These are the dial pulse contacts we'll call the upper one, the thin one, the movable one, contact four, and the bottom one, the stationary thick one, contact five. These contacts are connected to the two wires that connect the telephone set to the central office. The two wires are called the tip and ring. The tip wire is connected to stationary contact five while the ring wire is connected to movable contact 4. When the dial is at rest, contact 4 and contact 5 are bridged together at their contact point. This means that the tip and ring wires are bridged together through the telephone set at this point. This is known as the loop through the telephone set. Let's take a look at the dial action when the numeral zero is dialed. First you'll hear and see the dial action as the dial is rotated to its finger stop position and then you'll hear and see the dial action as the dial returns to its normal position.
Now we'll watch it in slow motion. You'll be able to count the pulses as the dial pulse contacts open and close 10 times. Let's take a look now at an exploded diagram of a rotary dial. At the very front is the finger wheel with its ten holes. Behind that is the number plate. Behind that is a two gear assembly, a large gear and a small gear. The small gear is attached to the governor. So when the dial is returning, the governor will control the rate of the small gear, which in turn will control the rate of the large gear. Behind that is the spring. The spring is wound up when the dial is rotated to the finger stop. This then provides the power to return the dial to its rest position once the finger is removed. Behind that is the cam that is used for the dial pulse contacts. Here we can see as the cam rotates, this arm will move up and down with the cam holes and cause the dial pulse contacts to open and close. And then behind that is the cam assembly that controls the off normal contacts. The off normal contacts will operate and remain operated as long as the dial is in its off normal position. During the wind-up, the dial pulse contacts remain closed and there is no central office equipment activity. The wind-up also tensions the spring, which provides the power for returning the dial. The amount of wind-up will determine how many dial pulses are generated as the dial returns. As the dial returns, it generates pulses, 10 in this case for the numeral zero. These pulses are received by the central office step-by-step -step switching equipment, which responds by stepping up the wipers on a Strouger selector switch. We'll look at a diagram of this operation, and then a video of the central office activity. So let's take a look now at what happens at the central office as we dial this first digit. When a caller originates a call by taking the handset off the switch hook, the central office equipment is activated and it prepares itself to receive the dial pulses. When the central office is ready to receive dial pulses, it has connected the caller's line to the A relay of a first selector. So here we see the A relay of the first selector and it is connected to the tip and ring wires going out to the telephone set and as we just saw those tip and ring wires go through the dial pulse contacts. When the equipment is ready the A relay ground is passed through one of its coils out on the tip of the line through the dial pulse contacts back on the ring of the line through another winding to negative battery through the battery to ground. So we have a completed circuit and the A relay will operate under that condition. As the dial uh, returns, as we saw, the dial pulse contacts will open and close. Each time those dial pulse contacts open, the circuit path for the A relay is opened and the A relay releases. As the dial continues to return, it again closes the dial pulse contacts. This closes the circuit path for the A relay and it once again operates. So if we dial the numeral zero, as the dial returns, the dial pulse contacts will open and close ten times and the A relay will release and reoperate ten times. A pair of contacts on the A relay will make each time the A relay releases. So there is ground on one side of this contact pair which is passed through the contacts closed when the A relay releases 
which leads us to the coil of the vertical magnet. And the other side of the coil is negative battery through the battery to ground. So each time that the A Rayleigh releases, ground is passed to the vertical magnet and the vertical magnet is energized. It becomes a magnet. At the bottom of the vertical magnet is the armature on a pivot. Each time the vertical magnet is energized, the armature will be attracted to the magnet and pivot upwards. At the end of the armature arm is another pivoted uh, metal arm called a pawl. And the end of the pawl engages in the teeth of the vertical ratchet, which is attached to the shaft of the first selector. So each time the armature moves up, the pawl engages in a notch of the ratchet and moves the ratchet up one step. So the armature operates and releases ten times, the pawl goes up and down ten times, and the vertical shaft on the selector is moved up ten steps. At the bottom of the shaft are the wipers, and the wipers are fixed to the shaft, so they will also move up 10 steps. And on the bank assembly, there are 10 levels, and as the wiper is moved up each step, it progresses across one step or one level of the bank assembly. So after 10 steps, the wiper will be in line with the 10th row on the bank assembly. So let's see what happens to the A relay, the vertical magnet armature, the pawl, the ratchet, and the wipers as the dial returns after the dialing of numeral zero. There is one more item to look at before concluding this video, and that is the events that happen during the interdigital interval. When the dial has just returned to its normal position after a numeral was dialed, the time taken by the caller to insert a finger into the appropriate finger wheel hole for the next numeral, to complete the rotation of the dial to the finger stop, and to remove the finger is the interdigital interval. Let's look at an example of the interdigital interval between the dialing of the numeral 4 and the dialing of the numeral 5. The video will show the dial windup for the numeral 4, and a split screen will show the return of the dial and the simultaneous stepping of the wipers to the fourth level. At this exact point in time, the dial has just returned to its normal position and the wipers have just reached the fourth level. This marks the beginning of the interdigital interval. In the next part of the video, you'll see what happens at the telephone set during the interdigital interval. At this exact point in time, the dial has been rotated to the finger stop, the finger has been removed, and the dial is ready to begin its return rotation to its normal position. This marks the end of the interdigital interval. Now let's look at what happens in the central office during the interdigital interval. At the start of the interval, the wipers have just come to rest in line with the fourth level of the bank assembly. The selector recognizes the end of pulsing and immediately begins to rotate the wipers horizontally across the fourth level contacts. These contacts are access points for trunks to the next rank of selectors in the switch train. Let's see what happens to the wipers in slow motion.
the selector stops the wipers on the first idle trunk. First idle trunk found is in the tenth position of the fourth level. This is the worst possible scenario because it requires the maximum amount of travel time of the wipers. Even so, when we look at this again in normal speed, you'll see that it is quite quick. We'll see both the vertical and horizontal motion of the wipers. The horizontal motion portion requires less than a third of a second. It is essential that the selector complete these tasks within the interdigital interval. If it does not, then one or more pulses for the next numeral will be lost, since they will not be received by the A relay of the next selector, and the call will not reach its intended destination. This completes the video on the rotary dial in the step-by-step -step telephone switching system. If you're interested in this topic, be sure to watch the next two videos in the series, Dial Tone in the Step-by-Step -step Telephone Switching System and Dialing Through the Step-by-Step -step Telephone Switching System. Thanks for watching.